Howdy, let's chat about Sony Animation. With the animated movie industry getting more disturbingly monopolized by Disney every month, and an endless tsunami of Disney live-action remakes hitting theaters, I found myself appreciating Sony Animation for just offering something different, and some competition for Pete's sake. At this point, I just feel like, sure, give me marketing shill and dated pop songs. At least it's uniquely Sony Animation. But with the animation giants of Disney and DreamWorks, Sony has often stood as the odd one out. So I wanted to try and figure out what makes Sony Animation stand out from the crowd. Apart from, you know, just being anything else that isn't Disney, what are Sony's most recent successes and most glorious failures? So let's check out the top five worst and best modern Sony animated movies. To qualify for this list, I'll be mentioning Sony movies from 2013 onwards. Hopefully this will give us a better picture of what Sony animation is like today. So without further ado, on to the countdown. For the fifth worst, Peter Rabbit. Some people would probably expect a certain other movie here. But Peter Rabbit didn't just feel like a defilement of the cinema. It felt like a defilement of someone who's passed on. The author, Beatrix Potter, would be rising from the dead in fury if she could see how her character has become like every other live-action adaption of a cartoon. This is the, uh, modern, hip Peter Rabbit, who's all about stealing vegetables from Mr. McGregor's garden, while being the coolest, most pompous, and vehemently annoying rabbit in history. You get your own character flaw. Come on, Benjamin. Why does he get to go? Yeah, why do I have to go in? Because that's his character flaw. It's set up with the traditional man versus the cute fuzzy animals plot but with a small issue. Thomas McGregor inherited his uncle's manor and garden, and thus also inherited the infestation of Peter Rabbit, with Thomas's only desire to sell the manor to start his toy store and leave. Now he's up against Peter Rabbit for his crime of not wanting a rabbit to ruin his garden. Oh. How dare he? What a monster. Take that, McGregor. That'll teach you for not wanting property damage. When Elmer Fudd was blown up by Bugs Bunny, at least he was getting his comeuppance for trying to attack Bugs in the first place. But here, it just feels like Peter is repeatedly trying to murder Thomas for protecting his property. This scene in particular sparked up some heavy outrage against the movie, many calling this scene allergy bullying, as it was seen as mocking people with deadly allergies. While I don't personally feel it did that, this scene does make one thing very clear about Peter Rabbit. He's willing to kill for his veggies, and not have a single care for murdering McGregor. While nowhere else in the movie did I ever actually like Peter, this really was the point of no return. McGregor's actions feel completely justified. I want him to win. I want him to turn this thing into rabbit stew. The whole thing just kind of makes me miss Judy from Zootopia, a rabbit I'd much rather give a carrot to. And for the fifth best, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 2. For those who don't know the original movie's story, the scientist Flint Lockwood creates a device that can turn water into food, but goes haywire partially due to the greed of others, and partially because Flint can be pretty spineless and swayed by others. In Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 2, Flint is scouted by Live Corp, a scientific organization it's been his dream to work with. Why he wouldn't want to stay freelance and running his own business is beyond me, but hey, each to their own. He could already solve world hunger quite easily and be his own boss. Maybe he thinks he'll do more good for the world in an organization. Well, I can respect that. And after he's forced to leave his home island, he sets out with his friends on an expedition to return to the island and stop his still working device from creating monstrous food life. However, I don't think Cloudy 2 ever quite captures the imagination and storytelling of the original. But honestly, to me, this did feel like the natural route for Flint to progress. He progresses from a successful science experiment to joining a modern science development team. But in terms of aesthetic and artistry, I actually prefer Cloudy too. The first film has the visual gimmick of it's food but bigger, which is fine, but it does get stale after a while. Especially now when we're actually living in a world where we actually have food this big in real life. Sheep as the modern world is bizarre. Anyway. This time the story's more like something out of a Godzilla King Kong film. Think, say, Kong Skull Island, except with all the creatures as food-based puns. Flamingos! 
chimpanzees! Those are some tasty looking jellyfish! That's just a tomato. I also really like the villain better than the original, Chester V. I think Chester almost works as a commentary on corporations who find young, bright-eyed, talented people and then try to use their creativity, passion, and talent for their own ends. Huh. And the police officer Earl steals the show once again. In the original, he was played by Mr. T. Yup, that's right. Ah, pity the fool. He was replaced with Terry Crews, who captures not just Earl's tough quality, but his loving nature far closer. It's enough to make a grown man cry, but not this man. Get back in there, Tia. So while the film has a lot of imagination, it still does have a few shortcomings carried over from the first movie. Brent and Steve the Monkey still feel pretty unnecessary. I mean, I get they're meant to be comic relief, but when everybody in the cast is comic relief, they have no identity. Not to mention the movie creates another comic relief character named Barry, who is, of course, a living strawberry. But to me, the biggest hindrance to the film is actually Flint himself, the lead character, which is never a particularly good sign. This time he's just ridiculously easily swayed by whoever talks to him at any given point in the film, which makes him come off as incredibly flip-floppy in terms of personality and motivation, and overall just a spineless dweeb. Wait! Sam! Wait, please! No, no, Sam, come back! Come back, Sam, no! Flint even abandons his dad, who's finally giving him the approval he wanted. Well, at least his dad gets these pickle things. Overall, while I felt the sequel had its funny moments, it felt like its main quality was just its visuals. But when the lead character is this much of a flaky, spineless twerp, it's hard to give it a full pass. For the fourth worst, the star. Hmm. As you might have guessed, based on the Christian story of Jeebus, we follow a donkey named Bo, with great aspirations to become part of the royal caravan, but who is humbled on his journey to carry Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. Yeah, that's right, we're going there. Well, let's dive in feet first, shall we? I'll try and be as tolerant as possible. While I don't think this could ever be an interesting story because of the hundreds of thousands of times it's been repeated, we do get a kind of interesting perspective here, because we see the birth from the animal's perspective. Which is kinda different? Okay, it's not necessarily original, but it, it's engaging enough, and certain aspects of it work out pretty well. On the animal side, Bo is a likeable enough donkey, and his friend Dave is a very supportive uh, dove who can dance. Also, I really like donkeys. That's my main selling point of the film. I like donkeys. Oh boy. And honestly, it's pretty refreshing to see that Dave is just a legitimate nice best friend. He doesn't have to go through some stupid character arc where he stops being selfish. He's just pleasant from start to end. Look, you lead the way, and wherever you go, your best friend Dave will be right behind you. There's also a lot of humanity in Mary in her relationship with Joseph. They're very grounded characters, and do a few good laughs for in their dynamic. I actually feel like these two could be interesting enough to carry the movie on their own. I mean, it's certainly a more modern, egalitarian relationship than the 2,000-year-old story it's based on. But in this case, I'm kind of glad to see it deviating from the source material. But unfortunately, Mary, Joseph, and Bo, and Dave being interesting characters, it's all pretty overshadowed by the star's hindrances that plague it. <laughs> Plague. <laughs> For one thing, there is way too many characters. The film tacks on so many that it's ridiculous. The worst being the camels of the wise men. These camels are just remarkably annoying. They have one single gag repeatedly done throughout the entire film's runtime. One camel says something wrong, the other says something wrong, and the Oprah camel, actually voiced by Oprah Winfrey, says a correct thing in the other two mocker. Rinse and repeat. They definitely feel like they were plonked in this movie for the kids. What are they saying? Shh, I, ca I can't make it out, but it's something king about the, the king of the shoes? King of the shoes? The main antagonist is also pretty uninteresting and doesn't fit the story too well. He's just some big brute that's tasked to hunt down Mary and Joseph, and he's neither scary, interesting, or entertaining. This is arguably the most experimental Sony has ever gotten, because when doing a project based on religious content, it's uh, gonna be viewed more critically by at least 30% of America, especially when they're trying to sell that religious story to kids. But hey, props are having the guts to make this movie at all. And for the fourth best, 
The Smurfs, The Lost Village. When it comes to Smurfs films, Sony hasn't exactly given them the utmost care. You have the 2011 Smurfs movie, which feels like little more than the generic, unfunny concept of throwing them into modern day normality, usually New York for some reason. And in 2013, we got a sequel, and it was yet more of the same. There was even going to be a third installment, but that got cancelled. Ironically, it actually sounded like the most original of the three. Hank Azaria, who played Gargamel, said the third film might actually deal with the origin story of how all the characters met. We may have been smurfed out, but Sony wasn't smurfed out yet. No, they opted to reboot the franchise entirely with a completely animated film that would explore the origins of the Smurfs. Though this time, we got a new take on the characters, and the art direction more closely followed the original artwork of the Smurfs creator Peyo. My, what a novel concept! Taking the franchise you bought and actually making it look like it originally did. Not butchering its animation? What sorcery is this? So when 2017 came by and we got Smurfs The Lost Village, we were given a story based on Smurfette, who was actually not originally a Smurf. In fact, she was created by their nemesis Gargamel from a lump of clay, who was then to be used as a spy against the Smurfs, but <sighs> the kindness of the Smurf village redeemed Smurfette's heart, making her a true Smurf. Cheap as I hate this franchise. But I do appreciate that this time, Sony made it pretty clear that the movie's aimed at a younger audience. And I guess that's a step in the right direction for the franchise. Because apparently, kids actually care about Smurfs? And not just nostalgic adults like me? And even if the story still felt haphazard to me, it's clear the writers were trying a lot harder than the original two movies. And I do respect that effort. Anyway, the film puts a surprising amount of analysis into questioning where does Smurfette exactly fit into the world. And I applaud the Smurfs franchise for attempting actual reflection. She's not exactly a Smurf, but she kind of is at the same time. As you would know, in the Smurfs franchise, all the Smurfs are defined by a generic trait that becomes their name and core character. For example, Hefty is strong, Clumsy is... I just ate all my rations! A fumbling goof. Brainy is a self-congratulatory twerp who's kind of a little smarter, but mostly just annoying. The film asks, Smurfette, what's your generic character trait? I can't categorize you into a box if I can't define you by your name. But to be fair, The Lost Village does explore the idea of identity with far more depth than the original series ever did. We get this kind of buddy road trip story, all while the Smurfs are being hunted by Gargamel in this adventure. They find the lost village of Smurfs is inhabited entirely by women. Huh. Then the two villagers come together to fend off Gargamel. I have to admit that the animation of Lost Village is definitely a step up from the previous movies. And performances like Rain Wilson as Gargamel really do steal the spotlight. What are you doing here? Well, I was thinking of getting a little place out here. Just a quiet place in the forest. It's a little breezy up on the hill. What do you think I'm doing out here? So with all that, The Lost Village is more tolerable than the originals. However, it still felt kind of cliche and pretty uninspired to me. The majority is biting off bits and pieces of the live action films and regurgitating them into this fully animated one. Which is no surprise, they're working with Smurfs, there's only so much they can do. Oh, I can feel it! I can feel the power! For the third worst, Surf's Up 2, Wave Mania. With the WWE wanting to expand their branch to a whole new generation of kids, many animated franchises started promoting them. Scooby-Doo, The Jetsons, The Flintstones. Each one had a handful of wrestlers guest star in really bizarre direct-to-DVD movies. And Surf's Up got this treatment too, and made all the wrestlers into extreme sports-loving penguins. Except for Vince McMahon, who's an otter who drinks fish. Or as he says, I just wish you could milk a fish. Ugh, I'm never gonna get that out of my head. Wave Mania follows Cody from the first movie as he meets his heroes, the Hang Five Extreme Sports Penguins, who are out to surf the biggest wave at the coolest surf spot, known as the Palisade. The Hang Five are also using the trip to pick Vince McMahon's replacement. And wouldn't you know it, the wrestlers pick Cody and his friends to come along and prove who is among them worthy to be part of the Hang Five. But you know, when you compare this movie to time-traveling wrestlers and Stone Age wrestlers, the surfing wrestling penguin movie is actually pretty tame and straightforward by comparison. 
It's essentially your typical road trip story. And admittedly, it's executed fine. As Cody is challenged to gauge, if all these deranged, dangerous and demented stunts is worth leaving his friends, home, and his morals behind, all for just a title. This is what I've always wanted to be remembered as a surfing legend, somebody respected, you know, like a real winner. And the wrestlers actually voiced the Penguins, which some might expect to be a disaster, but I was actually surprised by how seamlessly they lend their voices. John Cena and The Undertaker both really play up their cartoonish extremes wrestling personas here. We're trained professionals, some of us with huge muscles. I'm not gonna say who, that would be bragging. Almost lost my lunch. Overall, Wave Mania is definitely not the most inspiring ride of a movie, but it's steady enough and carries enough heart to maybe be worth a peek for wrestling fans. And for the third best, Hotel Transylvania 2. I consider the Hotel Transylvania movies to be some of Adam Sandler's finest work. Hotel Transylvania as a whole gives us an exceptional balance of fast-paced, sharp comedy, while also having surprisingly real feeling, fleshed out characters. And with Hotel Transylvania 2, that same beautiful animation, comedy, and relatable characters are all still there. The plot of this one focuses around Mavis and Jonathan having a child named Dennis, and they're concerned that Dennis being born human means that being within the monster world is a bit too dangerous. So the idea is that they're gonna move him to the suburbs. Dracula, however, is, of course, concerned with losing his daughter, as well as his grandchild. But frankly, I like him as a doting father figure, not only to Mavis, but also to Dennis as a grandfather. While the humor does have its gimmicky moments... If I show you I can bust a move, will you try to fly then? Uh-huh. It's mostly fast-paced with very detailed, very telling facial expressions. And the characterization is even further expanded from the previous film. Plus, the acting is really on point here. Like, personally, I feel Dracula was the role Sandler was born to play. It's like Kelsey Grammer in Sideshow Bob. You just can't imagine another person in that role. You can even tell just from his delivery of the blah 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 joke alone. It's just so natural. Where the film does run out of gas is more in the delivery of the story. The fact that Dracula wants him to stay in the castle and wants a vampire grandchild shows that he still has a bit of prejudice towards humans. And this actually works really well to demonstrate that anti-prejudice message within the movie's trilogy. And most of us can probably say from older relatives, or sometimes even parents, prejudice can take time to get over. But throughout the film, Dracula has said to Dennis that he doesn't care what he is and still loves him. Told you, Papa's always here for you. Again, again! Despite saying this though, the movie basically just invites the angry racist granduncle over for Thanksgiving at the last minute. And this is basically just so Dennis can reveal he's a damper, a human with the powers of a vampire. So Drax still gets exactly the vampire grandson he always wanted, which undercuts the whole message of I will love you no matter what. But you turned out to be the thing I wanted, so that's a win for both of us, I guess. To quote an old friend, I suspect Sandler and the writers were just up against a wall with this one. Perhaps Sandler just finally threw off his hands and said, ah, why don't we just give everyone exactly what they want. Overall, I call this one of the best Sony animated movies, purely for being in the Hotel Transylvania universe. But overall, I felt it was the weakest of the three Hotel Transylvania movies. Yeah, listen, if you think I don't like it, you definitely don't want to say blah 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 in front of my father. And the second worst Sony animated movie is... The Emoji Movie. Ugh, talk about a dead-on-arrival movie. Before this movie had even hit theaters, its advertising campaign had lovely inclusions like Patrick Stewart as Poop, with a clear swearing reference shown right out the gate. Not that there's anything wrong with swearing, but that just gives a very clear picture of the sort of bare-bones, generic, and lazy storytelling we're in for. So should we really have been that surprised when a story of a meh emoji failing to be meh didn't turn out to be engaging in the slightest? Okay, you can do this. I can't do this! I can't do it! Probably not, but what really gets under my skin is the movie's sheer disregard to be anything other than a terrible meme of itself. It's every cold corporate inclusion of cringe potty humor, shameless advertising, and ham-fisted internet culture jokes, many of which feel like they were added purely so that people could rage about it online. The Emoji Movie isn't trying to be anything more than what it shows on its poster. It's just emojis. I do actually think that's a shame, though, because I think there was a potential for something much greater here. 
I mean, what if the Emoji Movie told us an engaging story on how people could better communicate? In an age where so much of our communication has become abbreviated, what if the movie discusses a moral on how people could better communicate their feelings in this modern day? The idea of us embracing the future, that emojis, our new form of communication, can be a vehicle to better communicating with one another. Or we could just do poop jokes? Yeah, I guess we're going with that. <laughs> No, no, no. We're number two. We're no and the second best Sony animated movie is... The Angry Birds Movie 2. So, to me anyway, the first Angry Birds movie only felt like an actual Angry Birds movie in the final act. Because it was only then they started finally tossing the birds about to battle the pigs. Also, some birds had some magical bird powers. Anyway, fortunately, Angry Birds 2 already had that all out of the gate, and thankfully, it feels like an Angry Birds movie from beginning to end. Except the sequel sets up a much bigger spectacle story. Our main Angry Bird, Red, is proclaimed a hero from the end of the previous film. However, a third island emerges and begins an onslaught of ice balls on the pigs and birds. King Leonard of the, uh, Pig Kingdom decides that it would be in their best interest for pigs and birds to put aside their differences and form a truce in order for them to defeat their true enemy. That being Zeta, an ice bird on the ice island called Eagle Island. I think this was a smart follow-up, because we're introduced to Red's insecurities throughout the plot, with Red being skeptical not only of the truce working, but concerns that with the truce working, people won't need him anymore to be a hero against the pigs. Which is an understandable fear, since no one cared about Red in the first film till he became a hero. Will Red lose his identity, or will he adapt and grow with the times? All that good jazz ensues. The idea is pretty similar to Ralph Breaks the Internet, where Ralph is afraid that if Vanellope moves on, he's gonna lose the only friend he's ever had, leading him to become clingy. I could also compare the Mushu story from Mulan 2, but uh, the less said about that film, the better. But Ralph and Angry Birds 2 are examples of characters who become their own villain by not being able to adapt and grow as the world changes around them. Unfortunately, Red's journey is pretty poorly handled. Often Red comes off as overly abrasive, talking down to others to try and keep his status, and even risking the mission to save everyone just so he can have some glory. When you compare them, Ralph fell into doing wrong out of desperation over time. Red is just a jerk from the get-go and just always stays a jerk till he's humble. Oh, Red, so you did all of this because you were afraid of not being liked? I... Yes. There's also a kind of gimmicky B-plot where a trio of young birds lose some unhatched eggs, and the film repeatedly cuts back and forth between these two stories. And at no point do these two stories join up or feel connected. The B-plot would have been fine as a mini-episode before the movie, or even a DVD extra, but it just felt dropped into the main film to pad out the movie. And padding could definitely explain the rather distracting amount of stock pop culture songs that kick up every couple of minutes. And honestly, some of them don't even fit. Like when they play I Need a Hero in the first five minutes. But I gotta say, even with all that, Angry Birds 2 still delivers some very funny jokes, subverts expectations by having the pigs and birds work together with no betrayal twist, and simply made a solid Angry Birds movie. <laughs> And before we get to number one, just one quick honorable mention. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. I discussed this a lot in my best 2019 animated movie, so I decided to keep it as an honorable mention. It has a beautifully stylized animation design, meaningful character interactions, and cements itself as an unforgettable addition to the franchise. Definitely it's among, if not, the best Sony animated movie. But I didn't want to repeat myself, so on to the other number one. And the number one worst modern Sony animated movie is... Open Season. Scared Silly. I have to mention the single most boring, aimless, and aesthetically ugly movie of the bunch. Open Season Scared Silly. The fourth in this story quadrilogy of a bear and a deer, with one antler getting into wacky shenanigans in the woods. And in each movie, the actors get so fed up that they trade them out for new ones. To quickly summarize, Open Season was about a bear named Boog. He lived domesticated his whole life with a caring owner, till a deer named Elliot got him booted into the woods. Then he's rapidly pursued by crazy hunters. 
Open Season 2 was a road trip rescue, and Open Season 3 was basically the Prince and the Pauper. And in the end, Boog and his girlfriend and Elias had a family. But Scared Silly decided to throw all that out the window to retcon itself as a Halloween edition of Open Season. No mention of family or girlfriends, but now we have the gang helping Boog get over his fear of the wailing wampus werewolf. Seriously? And if that wasn't bad enough, the entire story is based on Elliot just making stuff up about the werewolf as he leads the gang on a hunt for it. Which means we get a lot of disconnected comedy that has no connection to any other parts. And it becomes a draining slog to sit through the movie. Just waiting for it to have a point. Open Season didn't look that appealing as a franchise to begin with, but some of these human models are just downright hideous. I mean, why would they specifically make Canadians look so repulsive? Howdy, Ed and Edna! Oh, sure! Good day, eh? Hey, you haven't lived till you've tried our poutine on the Ritz! And Elliot is just such an annoying jerk in this movie. He'll even destroy his best friend's prized possession. He'll even eat and very slowly chew on squirrel poop. Open Season Scared Silly captures everything that is aggravating about the franchise. Namely, that Elliot is a just terrible character, with not a single redeemable thing about him. But could you really expect much from a franchise that began its quadrilogy on this? I can't remember. And I think the number one best modern Sony animated movie is... Hotel Transylvania 3 Summer Vacation. This is probably the only good Sony threequel I've ever seen, yet alone great. And it's essentially just more of the last two's wackiness, except they're on a cruise. Yet this movie series manages more sheens of polish with every sequel, and it's kept simple all the way through. More than ever, the character motivations are completely understandable, and the build-up and excitement are top-notch. They even do a fun turning of the tables, where Mavis is the one trying to shelter her dad from a relationship she's worried about. And I think we very rarely see that sort of story in animation. Basically, the Transylvania crew all decide to go on a cruise, and Dracula falls in love with a vampire hunter. And that premise alone had me chuckling in the trailers. And moments like the garlic scene are freaking brilliant. Must have been the garlic in the guacamole. Oh no. Oh. Isn't that deadly for you? The comedy is polished and toned to be just right. I gotta be honest, in a very interesting, visceral way, this movie exceeds the entertainment value for the children of a movie like Coco. Seriously, I saw all three of the Hotel Transylvania movies in crowded theatres, and the kids absolutely adored all three of these movies. The kids were engrossed in their theatre seats and relatively quiet through the whole thing. Which is weird, because when I saw Coco, the kids were running up and down the aisles absolutely bored stiff. Even though I could hear adults sniffing back tears by the guitar song scene, the kids were going feral by that point. It was downright ugly. So I don't know, even though Pixar movies are obviously of a much higher quality calibre, I feel like Sony was connecting with their child audience more strongly for these three movies. The kids were entertained. And part of that secret is that there's a pocket full of high-energy, colourful, purely kid-pleasing moments. But I still really found myself enjoying it in spite of these moments. I was just curious of how each Hotel Transylvania character spent their time on the cruise. What did they get up to? Who they interact with? Did they bring their kids? And all the way it throws in both kids and adults unexpected surprises to keep us on our toes. Oh well, that's better than nothing. I also really felt the relatability of Dracula's story just as much as ever. And I like that they've taken his story in a new direction. Him being uncertain of himself and him wondering if he is a bad husband because he's trying to move on from his wife. And that seems very much like a relatable scenario for a middle-aged divorced or widowed father. When he zings with another woman, he's asking himself, does this make him a bad person? This sort of self-reflection is freaking brilliant to see in a Sony family movie. These are real questions people ask themselves when working through loss and grief. And we're hearing it all from Cartoon Dracula. But you know what? There's a lot of single people out there who are divorced or even widowed. And they certainly deserve a reminder that they're allowed to be happy. 
And it certainly doesn't have the stumbling third act the second film had. In fact, the third act is explosive in just how memorable and big scope it is. I like all the characters, I understood all their motivations, and I was excited to see how they spent their time on the cruise. I felt like I was vacationing right along with them. And that's exactly how I wanted this movie to feel. Hotel Transylvania 3 Summer Vacation is unabashedly fun, and it knows exactly what it is. It tried to give me a fun respite and romp with some characters I enjoy while keeping the kids entertained. And that's exactly what it did, and I enjoyed it. Two eyes or three eyes? Green skin. No skin. Prickly. Brainy. <laughs> And it's worth pointing out that sometimes, Sony has an uphill battle to stay relevant in these modern times. While I'm certainly not excusing things like the Emoji movie, Sony is generally working with less than half the budget of a Pixar or Disney movie, and they certainly can't guarantee the kind of box office returns that anything with the Disney logo can. This means we've seen them make some safer bets sometimes that the shareholders are more likely to agree with. But I feel like with some exceptions, modern Sony animated movie teams really do try with what resources they have. And within the limited safe scope their shareholders will allow, they're mostly trying to make something special. And you know what? Regardless of however many crass poop jokes it might have, at least it's Sony's own unique take on modern animation. And in an age of endless eye-rolling Disney remakes, I appreciate that now more than ever. Good or bad, sometimes we just need some variety in competition. So I'm glad that Sony Movies is still there, if just for that. And if you have an opinion of your own on these movies, it'd be great to hear what you think. Feel free to leave your own thoughts in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.